part two or three and I was thinking that I need my glasses I don't need them it'll make it like easier to read probably because but I don't know where I put them and I was looking for a good minute but and my room's not really the, the messiest right now it's just untidy and tidy it up hopefully I'll find it when I tidy things up after today's stream so I guess let's recap what we learned about the last two ones, right? Uh, first chapter was about how you don't criticize, and second chapter was about instead of criticizing, you know, give a compliment, and you you you'll see better results that way when dealing with people, right? Um, you know, our summaries. Uh, let's read our summary for chapter two. Appreciation is just as a necessity as food or water. The benefits that honest and sincere appreciation garners is enabling those who receive to want to do whatever it is more enthusiastically, to receive more appreciation, and in turn, a feeling of self-importance. By being aware of our disposition of pointing out or criticizing, it is easier to... to remove it's easier to remove our immediate emotional response in place of force in place of forced targeted approval of behavior that are most beneficial to ourselves getting people to do what we want yeah in a roundabout way all right uh number three chapter three oh. <laughs> i saw something out of the corner of my eye it's not not real <laughs> I'm not crazy. Uh, he who can do this has a whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. My mouth is so watery and stuff. Maybe I'm just dehydrating. Hmm. Really sorry, I'm dyslexic. Okay. I often went fishing up in Mar Maine during the summer. Personally, I am very fond of strawberries and cream, but I have found that for some strange reason, fish prefer worms. So when I went fishing, I didn't think about what I wanted, I thought about what they wanted. I didn't bait the hook with strawberries and cream, rather I dangled a worm or a grasshopper in front of the fish and said, wouldn't you like to have it? Yeah, why not use the same common sense with when fishing for people? That is what Lloyd George, Great Britain's Prime Minister during World War I did. When someone asked him how he managed to stay in power after the other wartime leaders, Wilson, Orlando, and Clem, Clem, Clem and Canyon had been forgotten, he replied that if he staying on top might be attributed to any one thing, it would be to him having learned what it what it was necessary to bait the hook to suit the fish. Why talk about what we want? That is childish. Absurd. Of course you're interested in what you want. You're internally interested in it, but no one else is. The rest of us are just like you. We are interested in what we want. So the only way on earth to influence other people is to talk about what they want and to show them how to get it. Wow. Remember that tomorrow when you are trying to get somebody to do something, if, for example, you don't want your children to smoke, don't preach at them and don't talk about what you want, but show them that cigarettes may keep them from making the basketball team or winning the 100 yard dash. This is a good thing to remember, regardless of whether you are dealing with children or calves or chimpanzees, for example, one day, Rudolph Waldo Emerson and his son tried to get a calf into the, the barn but they made the common mistake of thinking only of what they wanted. Emerson pushed and pulled his pushed and pulled and his son pulled but the calf was doing just what they were doing. He was thinking only of what he wanted so he stiffened his legs and stubbornly refused to leave the pasture. The Irish housemaid saw the, their predicament. She couldn't write essays and books but on this occasion at least she had more horse sense or calf sense than Emerson had. She thought of what the calf wanted, so she put her maternal finger in the calf's mouth and let the calf half suck, suck her finger as she gently led him into the barn. Every act you have ever performed since the day you were born was performed because you wanted something. How about... Okay, huh, maybe back. This cat, where I fed him, took him out, make sure he's taken care of, gave him a little bit of attention, wanted in my room, and now he wants out. 
He's only, it's always the same cat too, man. Oops. Lucky he's so cute. Okay. So she put her yeah blah 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 API key form. Okay. How about the time you ha you gave a large contribution to Red Cross? Yes, that is no exception to the rule. You gave the Red Cross the donation because you wanted to lend a helping hand. You wanted to just do a beautiful, unselfish, divine act. And as much as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. If ye hadn't wanted the, that feeling more than you wanted your money, ye would have made the contribution. Of course, ye might have made the contribution because you were ashamed to refuse or because a customer asked you to do it. But one thing is certain, you made the contribution, contribution because you wanted something. Ernie A. Overstreet in his illuminating book influencing human behavior said action springs out for of what we fundamentally desire and the best piece of advice which can be given to you to would be persuaders or would be given to would be persuaders whether in business in the home in the school in politics is first arouse in the other person an eager want he who can do this has a whole world with him he who cannot walks a lonely way andrew carnegie the poverty-stricken Scotch lad who started to walk at started work at two cents an hour and gave and finally gave away 365 million learned early in life that the only way to influence people is to talk in terms of what the other person wants. He attended school only four years, yet he learned how to handle people. To illustrate, his sister-in-law was worried sick over her two boys. They were at Yale and they were so busy with their own affairs that they had neglected to write home and paid no attention whatever to their mother's frantic letters. Why? Then Carnegie offered to wager a hundred dollars that he could get an answer by re return mail without even asking for it. For it. Someone called his bet. So he wrote his nephews a charity letter mentioning casually in, in a postscript that he was sending each one a five dollar bill. He neglected, however, to enclose the money, but but came replies by returning the mail thinking, Dear Uncle Andrew, for his kind note, and you can f finish the sentence yourself. Another example of persuading comes from Stan Novick of Cleveland, Ohio. A participant in our course, Stan came home from work in one evening to find his youngest son Tim kicking and screaming on the living room floor. He was start to he he was to start kindergarten the next day, and was protesting that he would not go. Stan's normal reaction would have been to banish the child to his room and tell him he better make up his mind to go. He had no choice but tonight, recognizing that he, this would not really help Tim start kindergarten in the best frame of mind, Stan sat down and thought, "If I were Tim." Why would I be excited about going to kindergarten? He and his wife made a list of all the fun things Tim would do, such as finger painting, singing songs, making new friends, and they put them into action. We all started finger painting on the kitchen table. My wife, Lil, my other son, Bob, and myself all having fun. Soon, Tim was peeping around the corner. Next, he was be begging to participate. Oh no, you have to go to kindergarten first to learn how to finger paint. With all the enthusiasm I could muster, I went to the list talking in terms you could understand, telling him all the fun he would have in kindergarten. The next morning, I thought I was the first one up. I went downstairs and found Tim sitting sound asleep in the living room chair. What are you doing here? I asked. I'm waiting to go to kindergarten. I don't want to be late. The enthusiasm of our entire family had aroused in Tim an eager want that no amount of discussion or threat could have possibly accomplished. Tomorrow, you may want to persuade somebody to do something. Before you speak, pause and ask yourself, how can I make this person want to do it? The question will stop us from rushing into a situation heedlessly with further chatter about our desire. At one time, I, rent, I rented the grand ballroom of a, center, of a center New York hotel for 20 nights. In each session, or in each season? season, in each season in order to hold a series of lectures. At the beginning of one season, I was suddenly informed that I should have to pay almost three times as much rent as formerly. This news reached me after the tickets had been printed and distributed and all announcements had been made. Naturally, I didn't want to pay the increase, but what was the use of talking to the hotel about what I wanted? They were interested in only what they wanted. So a couple of days later, I went to see the manager. I was a bit shocked when I got a letter. I said, but I don't blame you at all. If I had been in a position, I should probably have written a similar letter myself. Your duty as a manager of the hotel is to make all the profit possible. If you don't do that, you will be fired and ought, and, and ought, to, and ought to be fired. Now let's take a piece of paper and write down the advantages and disadvantages that will occur to you if you insist on, on this increase in rent. Then I took a letter hand and ran a line through the center of the head in one column, advantages, and the other column, disadvantages. I wrote down under the head, advantages, 
these words ballroom fee free then i went to say you will have the advantage of having the ballroom free to rent for dances and conventions that is a big advantage for affairs like that will pay you much more than you can get for a series of lectures if i tie your ballroom up for 20 nights during the course of a season it is, it is sure to mean a loss of some very profitable business to you now let's consider the disadvantages first instead of increasing your income for me you are going to decrease it in fact you are going to wipe it because i cannot pay the rent you're asking i shall be forced to hold these lectures at some other place there's other are there's another disadvantage to you also these lectures attract crowds of educated and cultured people to your hotel that is good advertising for you isn't it the fact if you spend five thousand dollars in the newspaper you couldn't bring as many people to look at your hotel as i could bring by these lectures that is worth a lot to you to your hotel isn't it or to a hotel isn't it Oh, I like that. He's like, okay, okay, my bad. Not to your hotel, to a hotel. So it's like, this could go to somewhere else, right? It's like, ooh. As I talked, I wrote the, these two disadvantages under the proper heading and, the, and, held, and handed the sheet of paper to the manager saying, I wish you would carefully consider both the dis, both advantages and disadvantages that are going to occur to you and then give me your final decision. I received a letter the next day informing me the rent that my rent will be increased only 50% instead of 300%. Wow! I knew I got this reduction without saying a word about what I wanted. I talked all the time about what the other person wanted and how he could get it. Suppose I had done the human natural thing. Suppose I had stomach stormed into his office and said, what do you mean by raising my rent 300%? When you know the tickets have been printed and the announcements made, 300%? Ridiculous! Absurd! I won't pay it! <laughs> Dread, per, won't pay it! Uh, what would have happened then? An argument would have begun to steam and boil and sputter and sputter. And you know how arguments end when if even if I had convinced him that it was wrong, that he was wrong, his pride would have made it difficult for him to back down and give in. Here is one of the best bits of advice ever given about the fine art of human relationships. If there is any one in sex secret of success, said Henry Ford, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and and see things from the person's angle as well as your own uh, uh, fuck i'm getting a little too excited again <laughs> chill out uh, just... lo-fi beats bro find my center okay it was one of the best bits of advice ever given about the fine art of human relationships if there is any one secret of success, said Henry Ford, it lies in the ability to get other person's point of view and see things from the uh, from that person's angle, as well as from your own. That is so good, I want to repeat it. If there is any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle, as well as from your own. That is so simple, so obvious, that anyone ought to see the truth of, of it at a glance. Yet 90% of the people on this earth ignore it 90% of the, of the time. An example, my nose is like fucking itchy, man. Look at the letters that come across your desk tomorrow morning, and you will find the most of them violate this important canon of common sense. Take this one, a letter written by the head of the radio department of the advertising agency when with officers scattered across the, the continent. This letter was sent to the managers of local radio stations throughout the country. I have sat down in brackets my reactions to each paragraph. Mr. John Blank. Blankville, Indiana. Dear Mr. Blank, the Blank Company desires to retain its position in the advertising agency leadership in the radio field. Who cares what your company desires? I am worried about my own problems. The bank is for foreclosing the mortgage in, of my house. The bugs are destroying the, the hollyhocks. The stock market trembled, humbled yesterday. I missed the 8 15th this morning. I was invited to John's dance last night. The doctor tells me I have high blood pressure and neurotis and dandruff. And then what happens? I come down to my office this morning worried, open my mail, and here is some little whippersnapper off in New York yapping about how what his company wants. Bah! If he had only realized what sort of impression his letter makes, he would get out of the advertising business and start manufacturing sheep dip. But this agency national advertising accounts were the bulwark of the network. Uh, our subsequent clearances of station time have kept us at the top of our agency year after year. You are big and rich and right at the top, are you? So what if I don't give two whoops in Hades if you are as big as General Mortars? 
General Motors and General Electric and the General Staff of the U.S. Army all combined. If you had as much sense as a half-witted a human hummingbird, you would have realized that I am interested in how big I am, not how big you are. All this talk about your enormous success makes me feel small and unimportant. We desire to service our accountants with the last word on radio station information. You desire. You desire. You unmitigated ass. I'm not interested in what you you desire, or what you present pre present of the United. Or what the president of the United States desires. Let me tell you once and for all that I am interested in what I desire, and you haven't said a word about that yet in this absurd letter of yours. Will you therefore put the blank company on your preferred list for weekly station information? Every single detail that will be useful in the agency is intelligently booking time. Is it useful to an, an agency in okay? Preferred list. You have the your nerve. You make me feel insignificant by your big talk about your company. And then you ask me to put you on a preferred list, and you don't even say please when you ask it? A prompt enlargement of this letter giving us your latest doings will, manually, will be mutually helpful. You fool! You mail me a cheap form letter, a letter scattered for far and wide like the autumn leaves. And you have the gall to ask me when I am worried about the, mor the, the mortgage and the holly hooks and my blood pressure and to sit down and to di and dictate a personal note acknowledging your f your form letter and you asked me to do it promptly what do you mean promptly don't you know i am just as busy as as you are or at least i like to think i am and while we are on the subject who gave you the the lordly right to order me around you say it would be mutually helpful at least at, at, at last at last you have begun to see my point of view but you are on the verge about how it would be to my advantage but you are vague about how it would be to my advantage very truly yours, John Doe, Manager, Radio Department. Yes, the enclosure reprint, reprint from the Black Blankville Journal will be of interest to you, and you may want to broadcast it over your station. Finally, down here in the postscript, you mentioned something that may help me solve one of my problems. Why didn't you begin your letter with, but what's the use? Why any advertising man who is guilty of perpetrating 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 such dribble as you have sent me has something wrong with his mandula oblongata you don't need a letter giving our latest doings what you need is a quart of iodine in your thyroid gland jesus fucking christ man i don't i don't think i ever think like this right about anybody towards anything well at least the first impression what's now, if people who devoted their lives into advertising and who pose an expert in the art of influence people to buy, if they write a letter like that, what can we expect from the butcher or baker or the or the auto mechanic? Here is another letter written by a super superintendent of a large freight terminal to a student of this course, Edward Vermilene. What effect did the letter have on the old man to whom it was addressed? Read it, and then I'll tell you. A. Zergras Sun, Inc. 28 Fort Front Street, Brooklyn, New York, 11201. Attention, Mr. Edward Vermilene. Gentlemen, the operations at our outboard rail receiving station are handicapped because a material percentage of the total business is delivered us in the late afternoon. This condition results in Congress over time on the part of our forces delaying to trucks, and in some cases delaying delays to freight. On November 10, we received from your company a lot of 510 pieces which, received, which, re which, when, which reached here at 4.20 p.m. We solicited your cooperation towards overwhelming, or overcoming the undesirable effect arising from late receipt of freight. May we ask that on days on which you ship the volume which was received on the above date effort be made either to get the truck here earlier or to deliver us part of the freight during the morning. The, the advantage that would occur to you under such an arrangement would be that of more exp expeditious discharge of your trucks and to assure that your business will go forward on the date of its receipt. Very truly yours, J blank B blank supped. After reading this letter, Mr. Valley himself is manager of uh, Zergsons Inc. sent it to me with the following comment. This letter had the reserve effect from that which it was intended. 
letter begins by describing the terminal's difficulties in which we are not interested. Generally speaking, our cooperation is then requested without any thought as to whether it would inconvenience us. And then, finally, in the last paragraph, the fact is mentioned that if we do cooperate, it will mean more expeditious discharge of our trucks, with the assurance that our freight will go forward on this date of its receipt. In other words, that is which we are most interested in mentioned last in the whole effect in one of raising a spirit of antagonism rather than a co than, than of cooperation. Let's see if we can't rewrite and approve this letter. Let's not waste any time talking about any problems. As Henry Ford ad admonishes, let's get to the other person's point of view and see things from his or her angle as well as from our own. Here is a way of revising the letter. It may not be the best way, but isn't it an improvement? Mr. Edward Vollinghans, Co. Azerson, Inc. 28th Street, Brooklyn, blah, blah, blah. Dear Mr. Varlimim, your company has been one of our good customers for 14 years. Naturally, we are very grateful for your patronage and we are eager to give you the speedy, efficient service you deserve. However, we regret to say that it is impossible for us to do that when your trucks bring us large shipments late in the afternoon, as they did on November 10th. Why? Because many of our customers make late afternoon deliveries also. Naturally, that causes congestion. That means your trucks are held up unavoidably at the pier and sometimes even your freight is delayed. That's bad, but it can be avoided. If you make your deliveries at the at the pier in the morning when possible, your trucks will be able to keep moving, your freight will get immediate attention, and your workers will get home early at night to enjoy dinner or, with of the delicious macaroni and noodles that you manufacture. <laughs> Regardless of when your shipment arrives, we shall always cheerfully do all of our power to serve you promptly. You are busy. Please don't trouble to answer this note. Yours truly, JB Sub. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty sick. Uh, I think I struggle with that too. Um, not so much like, like um, letting the other person, uh, like uh, saying what I want, and then leading in at the very end that how it would benefit them to get to get what I want. Not that way, but I kind of struggle with my. I was thinking with my friend Jim on the on the trip that were that I had. I think I talked about it a few times before. Um, he would uh, he told me he's like Nick, just tell me up front what you're trying to tell me, okay? I don't need all the preference. I don't need a everything leading up to it. I, I don't I don't need to know where you just tell me the, the 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 ending, and then and then and then if I need to know more or whatever, then just tell me the rest. So it would be like uh. Like we're talking, I don't know, it'd be anything. I should be like, okay, so this this is my conclusion. Now, and like, okay, and then, and then then we'll expand from there. But usually I'll be like, uh, okay, so uh, you say this, and 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 from my thinking, this is where I come from, and I was saying this because of this, and this is my intention when I say it, and then and and then I kind of extrapolate from there, and then I like, and that's the that's the conclusion, and it's like, okay, it's like it's just a lot, it's a lot to um, to unpack. And most of the time, it's very needless, I would say. And if I just, just jump straight to the conclusion, and then to uh, extrapolate from there, it's probably way more impactful, and it's more engaging, and there's a hook to it because, because um, like like you know what the payoff is if, if you better understand my my point of view instead of, um, uh, hopefully there's a payoff by understanding my pay, my my point of view, right? Or my or my insight or my perspective. At least that's how I would digest it. But like. Um, this is one of the teachings that were kind of missed by me, or I guess not. Like, uh, this wasn't as refined. Something that I needed to work on. Even now, because it's now it's just like like I'm aware of it, but it's just a habit. Now it's gotta break that habit. But yeah. Hey cats. Two weeks and a half. Feel good about it. I'm proud of myself. Okay. Barbara Anderson, who worked in a bank in New York, decided to move to Phoenix, Arizona, because of the of the health of her son. Using the principles she learned, yeah, learned in our course, she wrote the following letter to twelve banks in Phoenix. Dear sir, my ten years of bank experience should be of interest to a rapidly growing bank like yours. 
in various capacities in bank operations with the bank trust company in New York, leading to my present assignment on branch manager. I had acquired skills in all phase, phases of banking, including distributor relations, credits, loans, and administration. I will be relocated to Phoenix in May, and I am sure I can contribute to your growth and profit. I will be in Phoenix a week of April 3rd and would appreciate the opportunity to show you how I can help your banks meet its goals. Sincerely, Barbara L. Anderson. Epic. Do you think Ms. Anderson received any response from that letter? 11 of the 12 banks invited her to be interviewed, and she had a choice of which bank office to accept. Why? Ms. Anderson did not state what she wanted, but wrote in the letter how she could help them and focus on their wants, not her own. Thousands of salespeople are pouring or pondering the, the, the payments today. Tired, discouraged, and underpaid. Man, this is, man, this is kind of the way with words, man. They're just the pavements here. You know, there's pound, poundering the pavements. God damn, they really are, huh? Why? Because they are always thinking only of what they want. They don't realize that neither you nor I want to buy anything. If we did, we would go out and buy it. But both of us are entirely internally interested in solving our problems. And if salespeople can show us how their service and merchandise will help us sol solve our problems. They want you to sell us, we'll buy. And customers like us might like to feel that they are buying, not being sold. True. Yet many salespeople spend a lifetime in selling without seeing things from the customer's angle. For example, for many years, I lived in the Forest Hills, a little co community of private homes in the center of greater New York. One day, as I was rushing to the station, I chanced to meet a real estate operator who had brought and sold property in the area for many years. He knew Forest Hills well, so I hurried, I hurried, asked him whether or not my stucco house was built with metal lath or hollow tile. He said he didn't know and told me what I already knew that I could find out by calling the Forest Hills Garden Association. The following morning, I received a letter from him Did he gave me the information I wanted. He could have gotten in the 60 seconds by a telephone call, but he didn't. He told me that again. I could get all it, get it all by telephoning, and then he asked me to let him handle my insurance. He was not interested in helping me. He was interested in only helping himself. J. Howard Lucas of Birmingham, Alabama tells, has, tells how t two salespeople from the same company handle the same type of situation. He, he reported, several years ago, I was in a management term of a small company. Headquartered Near us was the district office of a large insurance company. Their agents were assigned territories, and our company was assigned the two agents, whom I shall refer to as Carl and John. One morning, Carl dropped by our office and casually mentioned that his company was just introduced as a new life insurance policy for executives and thought he might be interested later on and he would get to us, get back to us when he had more information on it. The same day, John saw us on the sidewalk while returning to the, from the a coffee break, and he shouted, Hey, Luke, hold up. As in great news for, for your fellows. He hurried over and very, very excitedly told us about the an executive life insurance policy he company had introduced that very day. It was the same policy that Carl had casually mentioned. He wanted us to have one of the first ish, issued. He gave us a, a few important facts about the coverage and ended saying, the policy is so new, I'm going to have someone from the home office come out tomorrow and explain it. Now, in the meantime, let's get the application signed and on the way so he can have more information to work with. His enthusiasm aroused in us an eager want for this policy, even though he, we did not have details. When they made, when, when they were, were made available to us, they confirmed John's initial understanding of the policy, and he not only sold us e sold each of us a policy, but later doubled our coverage. Our could have could have those sales, but he made no effort to arouse in us any desire for the policies. The world of is full of people who are are grabbing and see it self-seeking. So the rare individual who unselfishly tries to serve others has an enormous advantage. He has little competition. Owen D. Young, a noted lawyer and one of America's great business leaders, once said, "People who can put themselves in the place of other people, who can understand the workings of their minds, need never worry about the, what future has in store for them." <laughs> if out of reading this book, you get just one thing, and an increased tendency to think always in terms of other people's point of view, and see things from their angle. If you get that one thing out of this book, it may easily prove to be one of the building blocks of your career. Looking at the other point, person's point of view and arousing in him an eager want for something is not to be constructed as manipulating that person so that he 
will do something that is only for the benefit of his detriment. Each party should gain for each party should gain from the negotiation in the letter to Mr. Valium both the sender and the receiver of the corresponding gain by implementing what was suggested. Both the bank and Miss Anderson won by her letter in the and that the bank obtained a valuable employee and Miss Anderson a suitable job. An example of John's sale of insurance to Mr. Lucas both gain through their transaction. Wow. Another example in which everybody gains through this principle of assuring of arousing an eager want comes from Michael E. Whitten of Warwick. What? Of Warwick. What does that mean? Rhode Island. Oh. Who is a territory salesman for the Shell Oric Company. Mike wanted to become the number one salesperson in his district, but one service station was holding him back. It was ran by an old man who would not be motivated to clean up his station. It was in such poor shape that the sellers were de declining significantly. This manager would not listen to any of Mike's pleas to upgrade the station. After many ex exhaustions and heart-to-heart -heart talks, all of which had no impact, Mike decided to invite the manager to visit the newest Shell station in his territory. The manager was so impressed by the facility at the new station that when Mike visited him then the next time, the station was cleaned up and had re recorded had records and had recorded a sales increase. This enabled Mike to reach the number one spot in his district. All this talking and discussion hadn't helped him, but by arousing an eager want in the manager, by showing him the modern station, he had accomplished his goal, and both the manager and Mike benefited. Most people go through college and, and learn to read Virgil and master of the mysterious of calculations without ever discovering how their own mind functions. True. I, for instance, I once gave a course in effective speaking for the young college graduates who were entering the employee of the career corporation, the large air conditioner manufacturer. One of the participants wanted to persuade the others to play basketball in their free time. And this was, and this is about what he said. I want you to come out and play basketball. Of other people's point of view, wait, I want you to come out and play basketball. I like to play basketball, but the last few times I've been to the gymnasium, there hasn't been enough people to get up a game. Two or three of us got to a throwing up the ball around the other night, and I got a black eye. I wish all of you would come down tomorrow night. I want to play basketball. What is what? He didn't say that. That's so weird. Did he talk about anything you want? No. <laughs> nope. You don't want to go to the gymnasium that no one else goes to, do you? No, I don't. You don't care about what he wants. You don't want to get a black eye. <laughs> this is fake. Could he have shown you how to get the things you want by using the gymnasium surely more more pep uh, keener edge to, to the appetite clearer brain fun games basketball to repeat professor overstreet's wise advice first arouse in the other person an eager want he who can do this has a whole world with them he who cannot walks a lonely way one of the students in the author's training course was worried about his little boy the child was underweight underweight and refused to eat properly his parents used the usual method they scolded him nagged Mother wants you to eat this and that. Father wants you to grow up to be a man, big man. Did the boy pay any attention to those pleas? Just about as much as you pay it, pay to one fleek of sand on a sandy beach. Jeez. No one with a trace of horse sense would expect a child three, three years old to react to the viewpoint of a father 30 years old. Yet, yeah, that was that was precisely what the father had expected. It was absurd. He finally saw that, so he said to himself, What does that boy want? What can I tie up? what I want to what he wants. It was easy for the father who he started to thinking about. When he started thinking about his boy had a tricycle that he loved to ride up and down the sidewalk in front of the house in Brooklyn. A few doors down the street he lived a bully, a bigger boy who would pull the little boy off his tricycle and ride it himself. What the heck? Naturally, the little boy would run screaming to his mother and he would have to come out and take the, bu the bully off the tricycle and put her little boy on again. This happened almost every day. What did the little boy want? It didn't take a, sh a sh Sherlock Holmes to answer that, that one. His pride, his anger, his desire for a feeling of importance, all the strongest emotions in his makeup go goaded him to, ever to get revenge, to smash the bully in the nose. And when the father explained that the boy would be able to wallop the daylights out of the bigger kid someday if he would only eat the things his mother wanted him to eat, when his father promised him that there was no longer any problems of diet uh, dieties. The boy would have eaten spinach, sauerkraut, salt mackerel, anything in order to get big enough to whip the bully who had humiliated him so often. 
After solving that problem, the parents tackled another. The little boy had the unholy habit of wetting his bed. He slept, in the, slept with his grandmother. In the morning, his grandmother would wake up and fill the sheets and say, Look, Johnny, what you did again last night. He would say, No, I didn't do it. You did it. Scolding, spanking, shaming him, re retraining, re reiterating that the parents didn't want him to do it. None of these things kept the bed dry. So his parents asked, How can you make this boy want to stop wetting in his bed? What were his wants? First, he wanted to wear pajamas like daddy instead of wearing a nightgown like mother, grandmother. Grandmother was getting fed up with all this nocturnal inadequacy in, 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 in quiddies. So, she gladly offered to buy him a pair of pajamas if he would perform. Second, he would he, he wanted a bed of his own. Grandma did not, didn't object. His mother took him to the apartment store in Brooklyn, winked at the sales girl and said, Here is a little gentleman who would like to do some shopping. The sales girl, girl made him feel important by saying, Young man, what can I do? What can I show you? He stood a couple of inches taller and said, I wanted to buy a bed for myself. When he was shown, the, the one his mother wanted him to buy, she w winked at the sales girl and the boy was persuaded to buy it. The bed was delivered the next day and that night the father came home. The little boy ran to the door shouting, Daddy, Daddy, come upstairs and see what see my bed that I bought. The father, looking at the bed, obeyed Charles Schwab's in injunction. He was hearty in his appreciation and lavish in his praise. You are, going, you are not going to wet this bed, are you? The father said, Oh, no, no, I'm not going to wet this bed. The boy kept his promise, and for his pride was in, involved. His pride was involved. Ah, that well, that was his bed. He and he alone had bought it, and he was wearing pajamas down like a little man. He wanted to act like a man, and he did. Another father's father, K. T. Dutchman, a telephone engineer, a student of this course, couldn't get the three-year-old daughter to eat breakfast food. The the usual scolding, pleading, coaxing methods had all end, ended in futility. So the parents asked themselves, how can we make her want to do this? The little girl loved to imitate her mother, to feel big and grown up. So one morning they put on her a chair and let her make the, the breakfast food. As just as a psychological moment, father drifted it into the kitchen while she was stirring the cereal and said, oh look daddy, I'm making the cereal this morning. He ate two hippings of the cereal without any coaxing because she was interested in it. He had achieved a feeling of importance. He had found in making the cereal an avenue of self-expression. William Winter once rem remarked that self-expression is a dominant necessity of human nature. Why can't we adapt this same psychology to business dealings? When we have a brilliant idea, instead of making others think it is, our, is ours, why not let them cook and stir that, that idea themselves? Oh, uh, I remember. I remember. Oh, it's so painful for me. It's so hard, but I've been pretty good on this. Uh, I remember I was in a group of people. I forgot what it was. I was in a group of people, right? And and uh, we're, we're brainstorming ideas. And I come up with this amazing idea for us to all do this thing. And then we're all going to do it. And it's, it's going to be beneficial for everybody, right? And then and then somebody says, I have an idea. And, and then while everybody was kind of was kind of getting getting on board with it, you see, he just restated the idea. And I was like, that's an amazing idea. I love your idea. Let's do that, right? And and I think I think he realized well that it was my idea first, but then he just rolled with it because because I made sure everybody knew that it was his idea. And and then he was like, I got it's my idea now, right? I gotta I gotta do it. And then he was just just extra eager and extra ready to, to do it, because because he knew what I knew, but no one else knew. And inside, I kind of died a little, but it was a part of me that died that was insecure about stuff like that. And it's kind of good. But the end result was beneficial, right? So. Ah, <laughs> oh, god damn it. It's, 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 it's a good thing. It just hurts a little. You know, because each idea is like your own little baby. Uh, when we have a brilliant idea, instead of making others think it's, it, it is ours, why not let them cook and stir the idea themselves? They will, and then regard it as their own. They will like it and maybe eat a couple of helpings of it. Remember, first arouse in the other person an eager want. He who can do this has a whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. Principle three, arouse in the other person an eager want. In a nutshell, fundamental techniques in handling people. Principle one, don't criticize, condemn, or complain. Principle two, give honest and sincere appreciation. Principle three, arouse in the other person an eager want. Wow.
Oh, yeah, that's sick, man. It's good stuff. All right, let's write our summary. Hmm. So, um, hmm. Hmm. Dude, this one's a bit harder because, uh, the, 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 like, like the other one just like, you know, give honest to your appreciation. It's like, oh, just be honest, you know, only speak the truth and only speak the good truths, right? Or whatever. Okay. So anybody could do that. Uh, don't criticize or condemn or complain. Okay. Well, recognize when, what, what these things are and then don't do them. Okay. Sure. But this one arouse the, in the other person an eager want. This one takes critical thinking and um, the application of the first two principles as well as in sincere interest in the other person, right? Because to be able, well, I, I guess for the average person, I could, I could imagine some people who, who could do this or train themselves to do this don't need to try as hard. But uh, for me, um, people who I'm the most interested in or I, have the, or I give the most time and effort for or I listen to the most, um, I'm able to understand the way that that they see things, the way they break things down, the way the logic follows, and then in turn, um, I could uh, present things or give them things exactly the way that they need to hear it for them to to have a, an, an eager want to do it, or 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 for them to see the benefit, or, or to, to deliver it in such a way where it's very easily for them to see the benefits to them to to get them to want to do it, right? Um. Oh, five beats, bro. All right, well, let's just get riding, I guess. Um, so, so, um, uh, okay, so. In under standing of someone point of view comes. Comes uh, a frame work to operate operate within so an understanding of someone's point of view comes a framework to operate within. From there, it is much easier to to hmm, deliver, communicate ideas, to deliver ideas, to communicate ideas. Much easier to, I guess, deliver. Much easier to, because like, I think uh, like later on in the book it talks about how most of the time you would like agree on most things. It's just you gotta be able to talk to them and be calm and be rational and don't really um like like take the time to. Well, we'll get there when we get there. Okay, but um. Well, Is it to deliver deliver your
here once. That. This. Peels. To. Best peels. Do that. Person's point of view by displaying the benefits by displaying the benefits right. enter Benefits that impact, no, I guess I, whatever. Benefits that center around the individual. So, an understanding of someone's point of view comes a framework to operate within. From there, it is much easier to deliver your wants that best appeals to that person's point of view by displaying the benefits that center around the individual. I guess, right? That's pretty. I feel like my summaries are getting shorter and shorter, right? I mean, like, what else, what more do I, would I say, right? Hmm. And then you would just incorporate all, all of these three things, right? Huh. And imagine writing a book report on this. I haven't thought it, I mean, it would be cool, but I don't think. Like I'm capable of it, but I don't. I don't think I could do it justice to do a book report, right? Like I could do one, but I don't think it's gonna add much meaning or benefit. Hmm. Well, that's something to think about. Something to think about. Because if anything, now would be a good time to write the book report, right? Like, like a, this is like a checkpoint part.